Hola, ¿qué tal amigos Radio Escuchas? Muy buenos días, muchísimas gracias por estar aquí con nosotros en su programa Lo Mejor de Ti. Pues yo me presento, mi nombre es Patricia Nava y hoy tenemos un invitado de súper lujo. Estamos de manteles largos porque tenemos nada más y nada menos que a Jim Fay, creador de Love and Logic, cofundador de Love and Logic Institute. Así que vamos a platicar un poquito más con él, los quiero presentar un poco más acerca de él. Primero que nada, también agradecerle a Luis Mendieta por este espacio que nos da para llegar hasta sus hogares. Y bueno, Jim Fay es cofundador de Loma Logic Institute, fundador de servicios de consultoría escolar, lleva más de 30 años de experiencia en educación, incluyendo, eh, él es profesor, director de colegio, administrador, más de 40 años de experiencia como ponente y consultor, uno de los presentadores más buscados en Estados Unidos. Jeffrey se ha convertido en uno de los presentadores más solicitados en los campos de crianza de los hijos, disciplina positiva y gestión del aula. Junto con Foster Klein, es cofundador de Loma Logic Institute y coautor de Éxito de Ventas Parenting with Love and Logic. Se ha convertido en guía importantísima para los padres brindando enseñanzas prácticas y técnicas de crianza, alentando a los adultos a ser consistentes y efectivos en sus esfuerzos con sus hijos. And now, Mr. Fay, thank you so much for being here with us. And thank you so much for accepting our invitation to this show. Oh, I'm honored to be with you, Patricia. Thank you. The honor is mine. I'm, I truly admire. I remember when I saw you the first time you came to Michigan to a parenting conference. I was able to see you live for the first time and I look like I was literally you are a celebrity to me. You are. <laughs> I was so excited. I was like, I can't believe it's Jim Faye right there in front of me. I had the opportunity to take a picture with you and then take a former training in Denver, Colorado. I spent a whole week. I saw you have Having breakfast with me with, it was it was it was awesome for me it was a dream come true you are kind of like my hero in many ways and I know with many many families because your techniques whatever you and Mr. Klein founded and now Mr. Charles is just continuously doing in education is amazing it's one of the legacy I per se uh, I want to say of of parenting So I want to talk to you more about it because I know these didn't start like just, just like that. It, it had a process. I, I know that. So I, I wanted to talk to you um, about the techniques. One of the things that uh, when, when we hear and learn your techniques, you make them look really easy. It's, it, it looks like nothing is happening. <laughs> it's, it's super easy, but I know many parents, I'm sure they will relate to you as, as, as a man, as a parent. When you told us how many struggles you have as a parent before Love and Logic. So my question is to you, Mr. Fay, how was, uh, how you as a parent were like before Love and Logic was created? Uh -huh. Well, I guess I was just like every other dad out there. The only thing I had was to look back on how I was raised and then try to do it just the same way. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I grew up in a fairly happy family, but uh, parenting techniques were a lot different back there. And, and see, I was born in 1934, so techniques were basically <laughs> autocratic so to speak it was yeah my way or the highway and uh <laughs> I'm afraid of dad but still admired him and that kind of thing and so i grew up and every time i opened my mouth see i thought i was raising my kids but actually every time i opened my mouth my dad came out yeah <laughs> and uh, the anger and the in intimidation. And he, I don't want him to sound like a bad person, but that's the way they did things back then. That was the culture. So uh, huh? now I had little kids of my own and I tried to use intimidation and power to get my way and do it, do it now or else, that kind of thing. And of course, uh, 
my kids just didn't stand up and salute and say yes sir like i used to and uh, yeah yeah uh, i was getting pretty stressed out yeah and to tell the truth my blood pressure was off the charts oh no i can't yeah. imagine <laughs> I was pretty stressed. And then I became a teacher and I tried to use the very same things. Well, it didn't work out very well. I spent a lot of time wrestling with the kids to get them to do it my way and so on. Mm -hmm. Well, along the way, I had a horrible experience. And fortunately, this was in 1968. And uh, fortunately, this child's mother understood what was happening. But he was a little kid who really was a psychopath. Everybody oh. in the neighborhood was afraid of him. He had burned down the neighbor's garages oh, and uh, everybody was terrified of this kid. So they put him in my class because they thought I could handle him. And I tried to use those techniques. Well, those don't work for the oh. kid. Who oh my that. God. And uh, one day, I got so angry with him, I finally decided I was going to take him to the principal's office. Mm -hmm. And I grabbed his arm and he yelled, get your hands off of me. Don't you touch me. And so I did what my dad would have done. I just held on a little tighter and I wrestled him out of the room, mm -hmm. on down the stairs. Mm -hmm. And on the way down the stairs, he happened to say something that really hit home for me. You know, it's like a kid could call you any name in the book and it wouldn't bother you unless he got to one that was really true. Well, he did it. He said, I'm going to go ahead and get my uncle and he's going to come over here and he's going to kick your fat ass. And before I knew it, I had slapped him right in the mouth. And oh. not that bad, but a little cut, yep. and a lot of blood. And today I would be arrested for such a thing. Yes. And I had to go to take him to the principal's office. And the principal looked at me and said, well, you made your own problem. You solve it. And here I am. I called his mother right away. And thank goodness, she said, oh, I know how hard you've worked with him. And uh, the way that kid left the house this morning, if you hadn't slapped him, somebody would have. And I got through it, but I thought, on the way back to my classroom, I thought I can never go through anything like this again. This is so terrifying. And uh, so I went out looking for help. Yes. And uh, the help was not available back in those days. Love and logic was not there. Mm -hmm. So uh, I started making friends with some psychologists and they started giving me some little tips. Yes. And I did something that I didn't know was really good back in those days. I started experimenting with different ideas. Mm -hmm. See, when, you're, when your students take your class, they hear all these ideas and these techniques. And uh, pretty soon they start to say, I need to change. Mm -hmm. The really change is a terribly hard thing to do. What was happening to me back there was since I didn't have a lot of techniques to look at. I just started experimenting. Mm -hmm. that's what I hope your students will do is just experiment with different techniques until they uh, see how they work for them. Yeah. And I started experimenting with those and uh, some of them worked and some of them had to be modified. And, but it gave me kind of an attitude about how to work with kids and those experiments over the years, you know, they didn't always work. Yeah. And then pretty soon when I learned how to use them and I shared them with other people, I found them saying, oh, they're so easy to learn and so hard to remember. Yes. <laughs> Just oh, yes. remember how to do it. <laughs> and I, and uh, I think what it is, is I know that so often I wanted to do something that was much more gentle and probably a lot more effective. Mm -hmm. But back in my subconscious mind, I felt like I was betraying my father because I wasn't doing it the same way he was. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so for a long time, 
I raised two kids, I guess, who were practice kids. <laughs> Experiment <laughs> <And> kids. <laughs> They're meeting type kids, yes. Yes, yes. And then finally the third one came along and about the time he was eight or nine years old, all of this was kind of gelling and I could try some new techniques. Yeah. But I cannot tell you how frustrated I was trying to make any changes. And I knew I needed to change. Mm -hmm. But the thing that kind of helped me was I went to a party one night and there was a psychologist there. And I was telling her all about what I was trying to do. And I said, I, I just can't remember them. You know, I, you know, I know what I want to do, but I get angry. I get angry and then something comes out of my mouth right away. And then I'm embarrassed and then I'm disappointed with myself. And uh, she said something really brilliant to me at that time. And she said, well, you're trying to make too many changes all at once. Yes. Yeah. So she said, you need to just make, just work on one thing until you can get good at it. Mm -hmm. So she said, what is the one thing that you'd really like to do different? I said, well, I guess it's, I get angry so fast. Mm -hmm. And uh, I bet uh, if you were to look at me like, at that time, I would have probably looked just like my dad when he would get angry and we knew better shape up, but. Yes, yes. I, uh, she said, okay, I'm gonna tell you what to do. And she said, I want you to go home tonight. And when you go to get in bed, I want you to say over and over and over until you fall asleep, these words. When I get angry, I'm going to whisper. When I get angry, I'm going to whisper. Wow. And she said, you can't really control whether or not you get angry, but you can control what you do when you get angry. Mm -hmm. And she said, just do that. And she said, do it for 30 days. Wow. And I told her that was probably about the stupidest thing I had ever heard in my life. <laughs> right. <laughs> like that would work. But you know, I'm kind of a stubborn guy. So I went home and I started doing it. And I would say it over and over and over until I fall asleep at night. And about three weeks later, I found myself getting angry at one of the kids at school and I heard myself whispering. And I said, oh my word. Wow. I need to go back and apologize to this lady. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. This actually works. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did call her up and I talked with her about it. And she said, well, here's something else about your anger. She said, uh, if you wake up each morning praying that your kids will behave so that you won't get angry and you can have a decent day, how long will it be each day before you're angry? <laughs> said, well, it won't be long. Yes. Said, so here's what I want you to do. And you can experiment it at school. She said, on your way to school each morning, I want you to start praying that your kids will act up so you can experiment with one of your new techniques. <laughs> have have so, the opportunity to do that. <laughs> think about that. Yeah. How long will it be before you get to experiment? Yeah. And uh, I've told that to teachers many, many times over the last 40 years. Don't go to school praying that your kids will behave. Oh, you know. <laughs> Don't worry, Mr. Fitness. Yeah, it's, 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 part, it's part of the show. <laughs> Something is happening. Somebody was trying to call me in, and it rang in my hearing aids and made me all. Oh, no. <laughs> confused. Yes. So she said, try it out, experiment with it. Mm -hmm. that the kids act up mm -hmm. and just say, oh, I hope the kids act up today. I can experiment and see how it works. Mm -hmm. And that gives you a whole different attitude. When you're praying that the kids act up, how can you be angry for something you've been praying for? Yes. And so She made a big dent in what I was trying to do. That was a, a great big help along the way. 
So I would like to tell you that we just came on these ideas fairly fast, but uh, the truth is love and logic has evolved over the years. It's evolved slowly because we have come up with the ideas, then we've worked with our audiences and so on, and then we listen to people talk about how they're working and so on. And for example, <clears throat> we found out along the way that if you want to discipline a child and you do it while you're angry, uh, it's not going to work out. All they're going to see is what a jerk you are. Yes. And uh, so we discovered along the way that you have to be calm, mm -hmm. have to be empathetic, and if you want a kid to really think hard about his mistake, there needs to be some empathy. For example, oh, you wrecked the family car. I bet that feels awful. But don't worry. And then you can tell them the consequence. Mm -hmm. You'll be driving again someday when you get that paid for. Let me know how you want to handle it. Kind of hard to be angry with you compared to what is the matter with you? How many times can't you think you know, I'll tell you you're going to pay for that car before you drive again? Now who's the jerk? So yeah. the kid no longer thinking about his mistake. He's thinking about you. And the anger, yeah. like the anger towards you, because it's super, uh, it's really hard as when you're leaving the situation, when it's happening and you want to be angry, the last thing is wanna, you want to be empathetic with the situation. You're just frustrated and angry. And I think that's one of the main things that all parents, we as parents struggle. Like when I work with these parents all the time, I have um like um workshops and we have these uh training with them right now we ha i have a group of parents that i'm working with and i like that that's the, that's one of the things that they told me like how can you be calm how mm -hmm. can you contain your anger how can you not to be reacting when you're hearing or looking at something that it's com completely unreasonable or you or, or they're putting their lives in danger and it's really really hard to be content and then just not <laughs> to react that way. So it is one of the things, uh, Mr. Frick, because as a parent, you don't work by yourself. You work with your partner, which is your wife, your spouse, your and then you have that, um, you have to agree in many ways. And we know, as you said, we were raised differently. Uh, every time the generation comes and your generation comes, it's different. We, we have to kind of reparenting ourselves differently that from our parents did to us, which, as you said, is great. But we can, it, can be, it can get better every time. Every generation can get better. But how you, and I, my, one of the things that my, the parents that work with struggle the most is like, okay, I understand it, but my spouse doesn't. Yeah. So how, as a couple can work as a team to make this work and how you did it with, with um, and Mrs. Shirley, like how do you work it out to be, parents but to you know be partners as well uh, partners in crime <laughs> we don't yeah. uh because it's, it's different you were both raised differently in different households different values um and then how you come up with with this partnership uh, let me answer that after i go back and say a little bit more about the evolution okay uh, perfect so we could uh uh, use the empathy, then I really want to go into big detail about uh, how we can, we can both be a team. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, uh, I just gave you that example about uh, being really angry. The kid is mm -hmm. like the family car. Oh, as soon as we discovered that how effective that was, we started teaching people how to come up with what we called empathetic statements. Mm -hmm. So we taught, gave them all these different options on uh, these statements. Well, it didn't work very well. Yeah. Didn't work very well because they said, when I, when I see something that's like you say, unreasonable and bad and all of that, she said, I, did, I just go brain dead. I can't remember these statements. Yes, totally. So over the years, 
in watching people who are really effective. And that's where a lot of love and logic came from, is watching really effective parents do it. Mm -hmm. We discovered that it's too hard to remember all those words. Yes. So you come up with just one empathetic sound and you, yeah. you one that really resonates with you mm -hmm. and feels good to you. And you use that very same one every time you start to get upset with a, with a kid or every time they've done something wrong. Mm -hmm. And it might be as simple as, Oh, or, yeah. you know, if you lived in California, it'd probably sound like, dude, you know? <laughs> yes, yes. If you lived in Nebraska, it might sound like, dang. <laughs> True. Or, bless you, you know? Yeah. But so you use the same one every time and you keep it on the tip of your tongue and pray that you get chances to experiment with it mm -hmm. and you'll find some magic. And the magic is it changes the brain chemistry of the kid who's hearing it. But at the same time, it changes your own brain chemistry and calms down your anger. But see that, I would like to say that just happened overnight, mm -hmm. but that transition probably took five years from the time we started teaching people one way to where we got to way, oh, this is much easier. But yeah, we have dedicated our lives, Dr. Charles and I, to finding simpler ways to use it and remember it. Mm -hmm. So that that's that's the evolution and it, it continues. It's been continuing since 1977. And, uh, very effective in today's days. <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> very effective, yes. So let's get back to the parents as a team. You know, I don't think there are any two people in the whole world who see the world exactly the same way. Because our reality is based on all the experiences that we've had in our life and all of our perceptions and beliefs about those experiences. Mm -hmm. So we have billions of people on the planet who all see things in a different way. Give you an example. A teacher is standing out in the hall and she sees a kid running down the hall and she says to herself, boy, kids like to run. Well, the teacher standing beside her looks at that and says, this is a criminal offense. This kid is going to, we're going to do something serious about uh -huh. it. Another one would look at it and say, oh, I wish I could run like that. See? So now what's the chance that every one of them is going to react exactly the same because they see it different. Yeah, totally. And we tend to go out and we, we go out into the world and we look for a soulmate. And that soulmate tends to be somebody who has a strength that we admire that might be kind of a weakness that we feel about ourselves. Yeah. And we think, oh, this will make a great team. Okay. Yeah. Then what happens in typical marriages? We get married and we start trying to change that other person to be just like us because we can only see the world in a certain way. Yeah. And then we go take a love and logic parenting course. And then we say, oh, this is the way it ought to be done. If my loved one would just do this this way, life would be grand. So we set about changing that other person. And would you like to know the secret to turning somebody in, in, into an enemy? Yes. <laughs> Looks every single time. Tell them they need to change. Tell them they don't measure up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what we tend to do when we decide, oh, my loved one needs to work with the kids the same way I do. So that's a big no-no in our book. Yes. So what we really would pray for people to do would to say, Let's agree to be different. You parent kids the way you seem best. Wow. 
and I'll parent them the way I see best. Okay. And uh, we'll make an agreement that we won't sabotage each other. So if I see you starting in doing something with the kids, I'll stay out. If you see me doing something with the kids, even though you hate it, you stay out. And then we can talk about it later, okay? Okay. Now I'm not talking about abuse. Right. And some people can call uh, telling something they don't want to hear abuse, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about true abuse. No, it doesn't. This doesn't apply there. Right. But the whole idea is you do it your way, I'll do it my way. And the people who've been most successful learning love and logic, they say to their partner, I'm running these experiments. This is what seems to work for me. Mm -hmm. it, it might not work for you, <laughs> but uh, this is the way I'd like to do it. But you do it your way and I'll love you for it. And I do it my way and you love me for it. Yeah. They also make another agreement. And that is when the kids come asking for something, they say, well, what did your mom say? Or what did your dad say? And uh, they they don't they don't inadvertently sabotage each other, you know, because kids are, you know, they're human beings and they they are real adept at figuring out when we're vulnerable. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. yes. So who are they going to go to? Yes. If they want to go to, to, they want to do something they know dad would not like them to do, they go to mom and vice versa. Yes. And yes. that's where it's so important to say, well, what did, what did your other parents say? Mm -hmm. well, no, well, maybe, maybe mom and I'll talk about this and we'll let you know. Yes, yes, yes. And that goes to that thing that love and logic parents rely on so much is buying time mm -hmm. and <clears throat> we buy time and now i'm not talking about when there's danger i'm not talking about when a kid is going to pick up a hot uh oh, a hot uh, plate or something like that uh, that's a time when we say hey you know right. uh, uh, when they run out in traffic we don't tell them they've got a choice of being round or flat we, we go ahead and say, we yell and we get angry. We say, get out of the street now, you know? Right away. <laughs> but, you know, a happy kid has no value if you've only got a five minute life expectancy. Right. Okay. <laughs> right. And, uh, we buy time. We say, love and logic parents often say, oh, that was a bad decision. And of course, they smile while they do it, which means, it was your bad decision, not mine. Because a lot of times when our kids do something stupid, we feel like we've let them down. So we smile and say, oh, that was a bad decision. I'm going to have to do something about that, but not right now. I do a lot better after I've thought things over. Mm -hmm. As I look back on my life, all the things that I wish I had not done were things that I did instantly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't stop and say, I'm going to think this over. So uh, parents say, well, you came in late last night and we had to worry about you a whole lot. And we didn't get much sleep. And right now we're pretty angry. So it's best we not deal with this while we're angry. We'll get back to you later. And then if we feel especially vindictive, we can say, uh, Try not to worry about it because that'll keep them up all night worrying about it, right? <laughs> That's the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's just that it's as, as you said, it's really easy when it sounds so easy, but it's something like we have to practice empathy is not a natural thing. We know that it's, we have to practice it every single day with everything we do. 
the smile that is really a sincere smile, they can't even, they can pick it up right away. If it's not sincere, if it's, uh, we're mocking them or we're just laughing at them or we're just being sarcastic about it. It's, it's amazing how you said it and the way your you look physically, your face, your everything that you said, it, it looks like really true. Like you're not making it up. So it's it's really hard as parents to do that. And I was like, I don't know how Jim can say it so easily <laughs> to do what once, once you put it into practice. It's like they told me, like, Patty, but it's how can we do it? in the natural way when we don't feel natural. I think the tip that you gave us earlier, it's a key. The, re the repetition, they really make them feel natural to you until it's really installing to your brain. Mm -hmm. And it changed that chemistry. I never thought about it. You really did. I've been like teaching uh, a, a year curriculum for nine years now. And it's one of the things that, uh, that I, I I always tell them that that feeling of the of the sign of the sound of the phrase that is easier for you and for me always work always work a sound as well. It's like oh I just do that oh <laughs> immediately yeah. they know they it's amazing it those techniques that you're telling us it's amazing how it works immediately. I think that maybe a Parents don't hear anything else today, but hear this, it can change their lives. And that is, it's okay to get angry. It really is okay to get angry. It's just not okay to deal with the problem while you're angry. Yes. So you can be as angry as you want to, as long as you're not calling names or telling somebody they're stupid. But when you talk about yourself and your anger like this, I am really angry. That really upsets me. I don't know why I'm so angry, but I'll tell you, I am really angry right now because uh, I don't like what you did. But fortunately, I'm not going to do anything right now. I'm going to think this over. So you've got the anger out. Then you can go back. And the reason I can do it so well right now is it's not my child, it's not my problem, right? <laughs> and I'm better at it at that. Yes. But uh, I'm also quite good at it because I spent a lot of time praying that my kids could act up so I could practice it. Mm -hmm. And there's something about practicing it and doing it and doing it not when you're angry because there's no way you can ever do what I did when you're angry. Mm -hmm. Nobody can do that. Mm -hmm. And people often beat up on themselves by saying, well, there's something wrong with me because I can't come across in an empathetic way to my kid. Well, nobody can. Mm -mm. You just got to buy yourself time. And then when you're perfectly calm and the perfect time to talk to a kid is, I like the analogy, when they're eating their ice cream and we're both happy, then we can say, oh, remember last night you came home late and we had to worry about it. So, um, or you can wait until that time when they ask you for something, oh, I wanna go out tonight, oh, that'd be great. But right now, I don't think I'm strong enough to worry about you, so stay home tonight, you know? Then you can lay it on them, but you don't have to do it while you're angry and it's perfectly okay to be angry. Does that help? Oh, yes. Oh, it's, it's a big help because as you said, we as parents feel guilty. We're trying to not to follow the patterns that we have from our parents, right? The way sometimes they made us feel, as you said at the beginning, it was not intentional. It was not intentional. It's the way they knew best to raise your kids, us, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. right now we're trying to do a different way. But as you said, your dad comes out my mom comes out all the time when I'm trying. And, and the fact of not of getting rid of that guilt of not being angry because we're not perfect, because we're human, because we're learning with them. And then, and then they know. My, my kids, my oldest is 20, as I was telling you before. And now she understands. Now that she's 20, she understands how or why I said what I said and I did what I did. 
in and, and even use it when she babysits <laughs> all their kids. She repeats, she literally repeats what I said, which am amazed me, amazed me. And I know, uh, Mr. Faye, that you had struggles like every parent we we struggle the most all the time with behavior one more than others but what was your biggest struggle you have three kids three okay. kids <laughs> what, yeah, I, I don't want to I don't want to put names on it just maybe the situation that you live with your own kid like the biggest struggle you have to confront or endure as a parent Oh, that, that's really tough to look back because, uh, see, I'm 88 years old, so that's a long way for me to look back. <laughs> that's a long time. It, it, it is. What, whatever you, I, I'm sure there's some something like um, when, do you, you remember that it was, it was not, it was hard. It was really hard. As you remember that kid from the school when you were a principal, when you were a teacher. I think that uh, the hardest thing for me was wanting my kids to do well and uh, making it happen for them or wanting to make it happen for them instead of saying no they've got to learn how to do it themselves and uh, one technique along the way um, that really helped was See, my tendency was if they had a problem, I wanted to solve it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, was, I learned from my dad that a dad's job was to solve problems and to keep everybody happy. Well, those, those are two impossible yeah. things. Right? Yes. yes. So I would get upset and I would, if my kids had a problem, I wanted to immediately say, well, here's what you ought to do about that. Well, the problem was they didn't take that lightly. Right. They'd always say, that doesn't work. And right. that would make me so mad because I knew it would work, you know. Right, that's right. Stupid. Yeah. That's stupid. I can't do that, you know, all that kind of stuff. So along the way, learn from watching one really good parent who would say, well... First of all, some empathy. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a big problem. So uh, I'm thinking of one, you know, uh, the uh, kid is having a hard time with the teacher. My teacher doesn't like me. Oh, know? yeah. Oh, so well, here's what you ought to do. Well, I can't do that. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> right, you know, right. There it was saying, oh, boy, that's really a problem. And then she said, what do you think you're going to do? Well, that's a really empowering statement, isn't it? Yes. What do you think you're going to do? Because I don't know. And then she said, would you like to hear what some other kids have tried? Well, now that's still really empowering because now she's just given this kid permission mm -hmm. to say that won't work, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. or it might work, but they, they don't have to just outright reject it because they're not being told to do it. She said, well, let's see. Some kids just refuse to work for them, work for the teacher. And then she said, how would that work? Huh? And her son said, well, that's really stupid. I'd get a bad grade. And she said, oh, yeah, I guess so. She said, would you like to hear some other things that a kid would say? Some kids try... Um, when they go to school each morning, uh, they say, I'm going to keep watching the teacher. And when she says things, I'm going to nod like that and smile like I'm listening to her. Some kids try that. How do you think that would work? Well, I don't like her in the first place. Well, some kids try that. See? And uh, some kids, um, what they do is they... Uh, they actually go in the morning and they say good morning and they offer to shake hands. How do you think that might work? Okay. And uh, some kids raise their hand every once in a while and ask some questions. How do you think that would work? Okay. Well, I don't like any of them. Well, 
Some kids, they write a note to the teacher and tell them it's really hard to be in your class because, and you know, they usually get their parents to help them write it a little bit so it sounds sweet and so on. And then she just said, and frankly, I've just run out of ideas. I sure hope it works out for you. And left that kid with lots to think about. Yes. I thought, boy, is that different than the way I used to do it? Because I would right away say, here's what you should do. Uh -huh. And naturally, I started sharing that as part of love and logic. Uh -huh. That's where we learned so many of the really good techniques. Uh, I'd studied a lot of psychology, took a lot of psychology classes. I had a lot of friends with psychologists. I picked their brains all I could. But what I would do when I would see parents do something good, I'd say, how does that match up with mm -hmm. the, all the psychology that I was taught in those books? Mm -hmm. Because those books never taught me how to talk to the kids. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was only theory. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And Mr. Fay, I remember I read a book. I when I went to um, that training live in Denver, I really you guys have a table of DVDs, CDs, books, everything. Mm -hmm. I bought almost every single thing in that Not table. <laughs> like I need help and I know that parents have would need help so I can recommend something and one of the books everybody everything is amazing I always said go and get those those recordings in your car just put it in your phone just listening listen 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 until it becomes your statement it becomes some part of you that reparenting thing but one of the things that impact me the most was that book I read from Charles that's called The Bad Grades Through a Good Life. Yeah. And oh my gosh. And then he talked about when he dropped out of school and live in somebody's friend in the garage and didn't want to study and didn't want to go on. And I was just couldn't imagine. I mean, I, I, I saw his perspective. But I was just kept me thinking, what what his dad was thinking to let that go is one of the most uh, impact me the most that statement that Love and Logic has of like stepping back and watch my kid to experience life without me interfering is incredibly hard because of because you don't want that. So what were you thinking in that moment? That's the struggle that I'm trying to, to think how you and Miss Shirley like did to trust the process of Charles coming in, you know, in, their, in his senses and go back to school and do what he needed to do. How, how was you thinking and in that moment and when he decided to drop out of school? Yeah, well, see, he Charles actually did not drop out of school, but he just barely made it through high school. Okay. So that, and that, what happened was then he decided he wanted to live on his own and go down to Florida where his sister lived. Yeah. Well, in order to survive down there, see, we had, we had a rule in our house mm -hmm. and it basically said, um, while, you're, while you're in school, we will support you. Okay. When you're in the real world, you support yourself. So he decided to go out into the real world and support himself. Well, he had to work, I think, three jobs, to just to, three little jobs to be able to do it, part-time jobs and that kind of thing. And Yeah. So I knew that back in my mind, I believed he was a smart kid, you know. And I believe that uh, if we would plant some seeds along the way, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that would help. And he'd call up. And of course, your kids leave home. They don't call on the days when everything has gone right. They right. don't call up to say, listen to how happy I am out in the world. <laughs> they call right. up to, to say how bad it is. Yes. And uh, that that lady that I talked about before who would say, Oh, that's got to be rough. What do you think you're going to do? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I had that written by my telephone. 
<laughs> I had a little note by my telephone, knowing that <laughs> you will receive that call. <laughs> what I did, I would receive that call. And uh, Shirley and I were both prepared. Oh, boy, that's rough. What do you think you're going to do? I don't know, boy. I don't know. Well, some kids, some people try this, some people try that, and do that. And uh, then I'd go after that and go in my room and lay down and cry. Yeah. Because I, I so desperately wanted to just say, get in school yes. and I'll pay for it, you know, and that kind of thing. Yes. But uh, God said, well, when he's ready. And that went on for a couple of years. And pretty soon he's calling, he said, these are just dead end jobs. And I'd say, yeah, I guess it'd be rough having those for the rest of somebody's life, you know, and what do you think you're gonna do? I don't know. Well, one time he actually called and said, do you think I ought to try to get into college? And I, I was ready for that. We've been practicing for it. Wow. And uh, the hardest thing I ever did, this is when I really did cry. I said, oh, Charles, I don't think there's any big hurry. I don't think you need to race into that. Oh my God. <laughs> and uh, that, that really did upset me to say that. But I knew that if I just immediately said, yes, do it, you know, and all yes. that, that would not help a whole lot. And uh, finally got that call where he said, Dad, I couldn't wait for you any longer. I went over to the community college and I signed up for some classes. I had to take some tests and now I have to take remedial math and this. And if I don't get A's in those classes, it won't even let me be a community college student. So you tell me, what did I say? Because it was on that sticker right there. Oh, wow, what do you think you're gonna do? I better study. Yeah. <laughs> and, he and he studied hard and he got all those A's. And he went on to get a doctorate. Wow. But it wasn't because it was my idea. It was his idea. And what Shirley and I kept saying to ourselves is and we were so lucky to have people around us to support us with the idea that uh, the more it becomes our, our thing, the less he'll be involved. Because people don't tend to worry about things if they think somebody else is worrying about it. Mm -hmm. And they don't do things because it's somebody else's idea. It's so true. I guess, as I look back, that, that was a hard time. Wow. I so desperately wanted to make him successful. Yes. And I knew he would only be successful if he wanted to. I never offered him a job at Love and Logic. I never once suggested that he might be interested in it. And then one time I was talking to him and he said, what's new? And I said, yeah, I, I need to train another speaker. I just can't do it on my own. So I'm gonna go out and start looking for somebody. And he right away said, I want that job. I said, it's gonna be an intern job. It isn't gonna pay very much. He said, I want it. <laughs> and that's where we started working together like 27 years ago or so. Wow, wow. It's, it's, it's incredible how, how you knew that's probably the key here to plant those seeds. I guess um, the only thing or the main thing we have to do as parents is just plant those seeds and wait for it mm -hmm. and wait for it. I, I always put this example into my classes of a bamboo, you know, the bamboo plant that they, you know, to grow, in order to grow, you have to plant it. And it doesn't go up, you know, it doesn't go up until after seven years, it yeah. started to go up. And can you imagine in those seven years why you're thinking it didn't work, I didn't put enough water, maybe needed more sun, more shade, what can I do differently to speed up the process? And the waiting time is probably the hardest thing to do as a parent. You know that it comes up and I cannot imagine how happy you felt when he 
make that decision of coming back to school to finish up get his doctorate and probably the dream was working with you yes that was but the, you know to be able to uh, for somebody to grow like the bamboo there needs to be a good foundation mm -hmm. and the foundation that love and logic parents provide for their kids is uh, a belief system in the kid's mind is that the quality of my life is going to depend on my decisions. Now that starts yeah. when they're really young or as young, as soon as we discover love and logic. For some people, it's 14 years old. The kid is 14. For other parents, it's two, you know. Yes, yes. But the kids need to make lots and lots of little decisions, mm -hmm. the kind of decisions that are not going to end their life. Okay, and we say, if this decision isn't going to end his life, I'm going to let him make it. And then I'm going to for sure make sure he has to live with that decision, good or bad. So we start out really early in life. Do you want to wear red socks or blue socks? Yes. You want to wear these clothes to school or this? Yes. You want to take your lunch? Or would you rather see if you can go all day without eating? You know, all those kind, all those kinds of decisions. Yes. yes. Um, do you want to wear your coat or carry your coat? You know, okay. Do you want to do your homework or find a better way to explain to your teacher why you didn't do it? You know, all those kind of decisions. Yes. So that when he actually has to be, uh, when he becomes a teenager, Mm -hmm. somebody comes and says I've got some great dope let's smoke it tonight he's got a voice and it says his head that says I wonder how that decision is going to affect me mm -hmm. because that's what love and logic is all about mm -hmm. bottom line it's raising people who have that little voice in their head that says I wonder how this next decision is going to affect me because if you do that for them they have the gift to create a good life for themselves. And if if we're busy, like my dad was, do this, don't do this, do it this way. See, I was robbed of that. I had to learn that later in life. Yeah. But uh, so. And then was, as, as a parent. <laughs> yeah. I had to learn that as a parent and let, I had to make a lot of mistakes doing it. So. Yeah. Uh, People say, uh, well, I, it's going to be so hard to have teenagers. Well, they can be kind of erratic at times, you know, and <laughs> they can hate you at times and all of that. Yes. But generally, the life with the teenagers is just really a good time. If those kids have that little voice in their head, I wonder how this decision is going to affect me. Yeah. Because they are going to be out on their own. Yeah. They're going to be out there driving. Mm -hmm. They're going to be out there at parties. They're going to be out there with all the temptations that are out there. Mm -hmm. And what was lucky for me is when I was a teen teenager in the 1940s, the temptations weren't there like they are now. Yeah. I went through high school and I only saw one other kid drunk. Can you imagine that? Yes, I so different have good decisions to make. So uh, my dad's way of raising me wasn't all that bad. But uh, we don't have the luxury of now raising a kid who has a voice in his head that says, "If I if I do that, if I if I take those pills, my parents are going to get mad." We don't want them thinking we're going to get mad. They want them think, "How is this going to affect me?" Yeah. Yes. So start right away. Lots of decisions. But don't give them the decisions that are going to end their life. <laughs> okay. Right, right. As long as they don't put their life in danger. I, love, I, I always have that in my head. My kids are not um, kid, uh, kids anymore. And, and I always still have that in, in my head. And, 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 and I discovered, thank God, novel logic nine years ago. Um, and it really saved me a lot of of trouble, a lot of headaches, and, and I'm sure many parents, 
you you have given us so many tips, so many ideas that I don't want this to end, Mr. Faye. It, it, this is really a privilege to talk to you. But I before we end, I would love for you. I know you gave us so many already, but I would love, 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 love to hear from you. What is the most helpful advice you would like to give to the parents out there that are listening right now? Let me put it into a little clump of things. Okay. And the one is learn and master only one technique at a time. Mm -hmm. And do it by, tell yourself I'm going to experiment with it. Pray for your kids to act up so you can practice on them. And so, um, I, my job is to practice, okay? Be kind to yourself. Don't expect yourself to not get angry. Mm -hmm. yeah. But when you get angry, talk about your anger and then buy yourself some time until you calm down to deal with the issue. And I think those things take people a long ways. Yes. Wow, that's that's amazing because that's that you give us the tip of well, but like lots of tips, but the one with definitely leave them, leave their mistakes is some some like I personally struggle the most, but I think is the most effective. Just just watch, just don't don't interfere, leave them live their decisions and we don't like it even when they're two years old and they're and they have a red sock and a blue sock <laughs> next to it and they don't match and, and the jacket doesn't match and we want our kids to look perfect and we wanted to you know live perfectly in life in society and it's impossible because we don't have robots we have humans that they think and they need to experience and then they need to live their own life. And that's probably one of the hardest things you knew you as a parent struggling with that. So I know, I know we're still a long way. We're still learning. And I'm really, really, really thankful for you, Mr. Faith, because you gave us many, they were like gems to us, to me, at least. We learned a lot from you and we were really thankful. We're really grateful for you to be here today with us. Oh, and it was so much fun for me to be with you today. I love talking about these things and you gave me a great opportunity. So keep up the good work with the parents. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fray. I, I wouldn't have done it without you. It definitely helped me as a, as a facilitator of the Love and Logic curriculum, definitely experimenting, as you said. My kids are an experiment the whole time. And when I talk, to my experience as a parent of my kids, it gives them another perspective. That's what I wanted to talk to you about it because I know these techniques, love and logic curriculum wasn't created just like that. It was struggling, it was practicing, it was from a parent perspective because you're a parent. So you know the struggles along the way and how much you learn from wise parents, from your own experience to become these marvelous curriculum that I don't know what to do without it. Like 20 years ago, I didn't know Love and Logic. I didn't know Love and Logic. I had to read a lot. I left my country and I couldn't talk to my parents to ask for advice either. I couldn't. I have to raise myself with books. Um, my mother-in-law gave me all these books that it, it gave me ideas on how to create a better parenting than I had before when I was a kid. So I know that experience and experiments are the only key for successful as a parent. <laughs> Thank you, Patricia. So thank you so much, Mr. Fay. I hope I can talk to Charles later on so we can uh, we can go and see different perspective because I know he has his perspective and you have your perspective and it's definitely um, a learning process to us parents that we're trying to raise better and responsible kids. So thank you so much, Mr. Fay, for your time, for everything and, and, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to say goodbye to our audience, but don't go so I can say goodbye to you out in the air. 
Ok, amigos, pues muchísimas gracias por haber estado aquí hoy en este programa Lo Mejor de Ti con Jim Fay. De verdad fue un honor, es un honor poder haber estado con él, hablar con él, escuchar su experiencia. Y no dejen de, de entrar a la página www.loveandlogic.org, suscríbanse a todo el newsletter, todo lo que los tienen que decir, uh, manden sus preguntas porque siempre nos contestan. Y, y bueno, yo me despido. Eh, muchísimas gracias, Luis Mendieta, por este espacio. Y no, recuerden también seguirme en patricia-facilitator20 y para que sigan los cursos y no se pierdan de ninguno de estos talleres de Love and Logic. Uh, pues muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much, Mr. Fay, and uh, see you next time. Thank you. Hasta la próxima. Gracias. Te pasamos los micrófonos, Luis. <laughs>